this talk. Um, let's see, have I got everything? You can, oh, I should turn the internet on as well. On my computer, that is. The internet's, the internet's still there. <laughs> um, yeah, there's this URL that, uh, I'm actually mic'd up, so I don't need to stand next to this thing, which is great. Um, but yeah, there's this URL, you can go to this URL, and I'm told that it goes into the internet, and it comes out here, so I can see any questions that you send me. So uh, let's begin. Hey, what's up? Hi, welcome. Um, I'm going to be talking about how I hacked the UK tax system. Uh, if you're wondering how did this man hack the UK tax system, that's what this talk is about. It's called How I Hacked the UK Tax System. No, it's not. It's called How to Hack the UK Tax System. All right, so this is like an obligatory slide. Um, I'm going to say it now because I feel like you're, uh, it would be rude for you to leave at this point. Uh, this is the mostly unintelligible name I go by on the internet, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Um, I have quite an eclectic background. I started doing like biomedicine type stuff. I worked in hospitals for a while. I worked in the government. I was a full stack engineer. I started breaking tons of things. I made some money off bug bounties. I eventually ended up at Twitch, which uh, where I work today. And I, I, I love being there. It's a wonderful place. Um, oops, sorry. I forget that all of you guys are sort of in here somehow. Um, but uh, I just want to say thanks everybody for watching and also the people who are like in the future who are watching a recording of this. I want to say thank you to them even though they're experiencing that in the present or we're ex not experiencing that yet. It's just a, just a thought that I had. Um, all right, this is the lowdown slide. Uh, considering this condenses my entire like 50,000 word article and this presentation into one slide, you might as well just read this and then leave. Um, but if you don't leave, I want you to know that I appreciate you being here with me, with me talking at you for 30 minutes or however long I take doing this. So, the thing that I found was I could read and write financial data for any UK taxpayer using the online service system. Now, keyword there is taxpayer because that includes people who aren't necessarily UK citizens. Um, it is an XSS vulnerability. Um, there's also a redirect after login issue, which I'll go through the whole story in a second because it's a pretty interesting and fun story. Um, I wrote proof of concept, which uh, brings up a pop-up window and tells you how much you earned last tax year, which probably won't come as a surprise, hopefully, but I'm demonstrating that you can do that thing. I'm not trying to actually destroy the tax system because then I would be a criminal, and that's bad. Um, so it took about 43 days to acknowledge it and about two weeks to fix it, which is just... I don't know, you can draw your own conclusions for that. And I, the last point is I just want everybody to remember that the computer's trying its best and we can't blame the computer. Okay. Um, as I am now an adult, uh, it is adult tradition to look at taxes and things and go, wow, look at all that money that I could spend on video games, thousands of tiny 3D printed statues of myself um, that's spent on useless things like healthcare and infrastructure and schools. I don't know what happens to all this money. Um, I actually have this illustrative photo that I whipped up that actually shows what you do with all these 3D printed statues of yourself, right? <laughs> so you just push them in your enemy's <coughs> letterbox, just like that, and then they, it's like sand, and they can't get rid of them, and they get stuck in everywhere. Anyway, that's, my, that's what I usually use my money for, but I haven't been able to because of taxes, and that's, this whole, that's what this whole talk's about, really. Um, okay, so... I'm using the tax system, and I noticed there's this like forwarding URL, which is, you probably can't see this because I made this way too small, but um, it's like taxesservice.gov.uk, sign in, and there's a continue URL, it's like my taxes slash account, right? And I've done bug bounties. I know what that means. That means there's like a 30% chance that there's an open redirect vulnerability. So, you know, it's like the middle of the night. I don't have anything better to do. Well, I got my taxes to do, but I don't really have anything I want to do. So. I, I look into it and I see what I can do with it, and it turns out that I can inject this symbol, which is called an at sign, I'm told. And what that does is, like, once you're logged into your tax system, the whole login system is actually really impressive. It like sends a text email thing to your phone or whatever, and you get type your username and password in. Once all that's done, then I can send you anywhere I want on the internet. Um, I think I actually have a slide. Oh yeah, yeah, I have a slide on how to use this. Like my theory is here, like. Things like uh, open redirect or whatever, they don't mean anything fundamentally, they're just words. And the best way to make somebody care about something is to inadvertently end up threatening them by mistake. So, um, 
you click a link that objectively goes to the UK tax system and you enter your details, you're now on my phishing site, though you may not know it. Um, I've got this dog here that my research scientist has spent years cooking up. This is my phishing website. And the dog beckons you to enter all your bank details or whatever the hell I'm trying to, I don't know what criminals do, I'm not criminal, trust me. Or, I don't know, maybe that's what a criminal would say. Anyway, the dog beckons you to enter your earlier details and, I don't know, now I've owned your bank account or something. In the final vision, I'm hoping to have like a fully 3D rendered real-time dog with like fur effects. I'm gonna like download a dog's brain into the computer and it's gonna woof and it's gonna be, it's gonna be nice and it's gonna like encourage you to enter all your secret information directly into my evil website. But not really, because I'm not a bad person. I wouldn't do that. All right, so it's responsible disclosure time and we found an issue and we all know what that means and that means if we're good people, and I hope we are good people. I don't know why I keep talking about that. It's, 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 an, it's an odd thing. I, I, don't, I don't do bad things, I promise. Um, then we do a special sacred dance called Responsible Disclosure. And um, that basically consists of trying to make other people care about something as much as you do, uh, pretty much. And um, it was a difficult time. It was a difficult time. Actually, all of this took the, uh, went over the span of three days, but they were very emotionally exhausting three days, so I'd like you to multiply that by a lot. There's a, there is a 50 day like span after this, I promise, but just I'm just trying to get across. It was an exhausting time. So the first thing I did was I emailed security at gov.uk because I feel like that's the, the secret security handshake, right? You, you email security at and then, I don't know, somebody who's a real security engineer talks to you. What's that XKCD comic about pressing a number and getting to talk to a real engineer? It's like the same thing, basically. Well, anyway, that didn't work. The email bounced, uh, which means it didn't go through. I'm not that familiar with computers, I'll be honest with you. Um, so then I just Googled reporting of vulnerability in the UK government system. So it turns out they have a responsible disclosure program, but it's private, and I wasn't invited to it, which I was a bit disappointed in, but you know, like, not everybody can value me as much as I do. Um, so I message at gov.uk on Twitter, because like, I don't know, fundamentally I solve all my problems by messaging people on Twitter these days. And I'm completely ignored, which is, you know, that's, it's Twitter, right? Everybody ignores you, or is that just me? Anyway, so and then I messaged the NCSC, which is the National Cyber Security Center of the UK on Twitter, and uh, it, it says on this slide that I was forwarded to a fraud prevention website. So, like, hacked the UK tax system, and then they told me how I can go and report someone who's like, phishing me or something, and that just doesn't seem like, that doesn't seem like, like the right thing to do, like, report that somebody was trying to scam me out of my bank details, because in, in truth, I was trying to scam everyone else out of the bank details. Well, I wasn't trying to. I'm, not, I'm a good person, right? Um, so anyway, then all these other people from the internet start sending me messages. The HMRC customers account, which is actually a verified account on Twitter. I don't, I'm saying this, you'll, you'll find out why I'm saying it in a second. They, they hit me up and they say, follow me on Twitter and we'll DM you and we can talk about like the issues and stuff. So anyway, I follow them on Twitter and they never follow me back, just like everyone else on Twitter. <laughs> and um, they, they never respond. Then. HMRC press office, which is not a confirmed, it's like it's not even a verified account on Twitter, but they're doling out all this information about tax systems. Uh, they ask me to call them on the, this thing. This is a telephone, right? I've never done a disclosure to the telephone anyway. Oh, also this background. I picked this background very specifically. It's kind of strange, as you might see, because like, I feel like it represents what a responsible disclosure is, what is like. Here I am, I'm this very well-dressed chicken-like creature. I've traveled across lands for great distances, and I'm presenting this liar, which represents the responsible disclosure I'm making. And this guy, this, uh, the pig with the snake for a tongue and a face on its chest, he's just gonna stare at me for 50 days while we do nothing, and then eventually maybe, I don't know, the crocodile will help us out. That's the story behind the background picture. Cool, uh, I think I've talked about everything I need to talk about on that slide. Just wondering, oh yeah, I made this cool uh, diagram for the article I wrote, which I said is really long, but I think it's better than this talk, so you should go read that. Um, and I just put these cool pictures in. Anyway, this is fundamentally like rounds up everything that happened. I email security at gov.uk, nothing happens. There's a builder in the way. I message gov.uk, this guy with the suit comes at me, he says stop. Then there's like a dog who, when I message the NCC. Eventually the Pope, that's not the Pope, is it? That's just a priest. Uh, does anyone know what that hat means? I'm not sure. Okay, then finally, I'm instructed to use this thing, which I've never used before in my life. I don't know what that is. I've only just learned what the internet is. Um, so that's apparent, that's the, I'm just saying this is like a, this is what responsible disclosure is gonna be now. Everybody's gonna have to telephone 
me and tell me what, where the vulnerabilities are, and I'll forward it on to the relevant people. All right, uh, I was just messing around with a bunch of, a bunch of that, I guess. Here's uh, really hacking the UK tech system. So, like, when I get a positive response, I got a vaguely positive response in that I got a telephone contact and they seem to receive my email. Um, I like to delve a little deeper and find some more things that might be interesting because I don't know, that's just what I do with my time. I don't, I don't have to explain that. Um, so I'm looking around and there's this interesting .htm file that's loaded with every single load of the UK tax system login page and it includes this just like astonishingly confusing text that just means nothing. Um, let's, I think I have a, like a bigger view of it here. This is, uh, this is a code, I believe. Um, We've got like some HTML in here, we've got some nonsense, we have JavaScript of some kind, we have some more nonsense, and then you can't see the rest of it because it doesn't fit in the slide. So uh, I think, yeah, I've got some more slides. This is what I see. Well, I mean, I see the same thing as you, but this is what I think when I see it. Um, we have the HTML preamble, there's this unpacked scope, a symbol table that binds the packed code to the unpacked code, something to evaluate the unpacked code, and all this code that unpacks all the code. Anyway, it's a form of obfuscation. They're trying to hide what the code does. Um, luckily, I, for some reason, have messed around with that quite a lot, and I know how to reverse this. Um, I'm gonna do a demo of that, I think. Oh, well, let's go through this slide first. Let's talk about obfuscation. First off, I don't know much about binary. I know there's like obfuscation t technologies with binary code, and they're pretty good but it's not a good idea with JavaScript, generally speaking. Um, I think I have a good phrase that I've written here somewhere. Um, if code is still executed in a context which an adversary has control over, they can still capture and interrogate the code to see what it does and any secrets that lie inside of theirs. Which sounds really cool, actually. I'm so glad I wrote that. So I haven't got, like, I've, I've just made these terms up, but I think they categorize forms of obfuscation pretty well. There's like this symbolic replacement where you take something that people understand and replace it with something that nobody understands. And there's this other thing, oh, that's the same thing. Then you take chi and you turn it into hexadecimal because nobody understands hexadecimal. Nobody should understand hexadecimal. Then there's unpack and eval, which is the one that we previously saw where it's like, there's like a dictionary, there's a corpus of packed code, and then there's some code to unpack it. Both of those can be defeated by some mixture of two pretty simple principles. Um, usually I just throw it, uh, it into Clojure Compiler, which is like an optimizing JavaScript compiler, and it undoes a lot of the symbolic substitution, even the more complex stuff, because it'll optimize certain loops that they put in to try and confuse you. It'll optimize those out. And then the other thing is, uh, with the packing thing, the unpacking code will by necessity produce a JavaScript function, and you can usually just get a handle on that function and then use dot two string to get the full the full code of that function. Anyway, if that's confusing, and I think it is pretty confusing, I've got a demonstration here. And this is actually quite a fun demonstration because after I made this, I, I did this whole disclosure to the government, everything worked out. I don't think I actually explained that yet, but it did work out in the end. Um, uh, the, I also made the disclosure to the people who made the third party component, the fingerprinting component. I don't think I even told you this is a fingerprinting component. Sorry, I'm new to this whole thing. Um, and uh, they've actually since doubled down on obfuscation after I told them not to use it. Uh, but they have fixed the vulnerability. So this is going to be a more interesting one than it might have originally been because when I originally reversed this, I simply just removed this thing and then did dot two string, and that gave me the full uh, uh, deobfuscated code. So we're going to go through deobfuscating the more deobfuscated code that is now uh, present in ego.io, which is the uh, vendor that produced this code. OK, so first we copy out this thing, which is all the JavaScript code. Notice we've already removed this. I forgot to mention that. Or did I? You remove that. Uh, you paste that into your JavaScript terminal developer tools console. Um, then. You add a dot two string. <laughs> that gives you a new JavaScript string, but oh whoa, uh, it's actually given you another obfuscated thing, which is confusing. But don't worry, they've actually just double obfuscated it. They've done the same thing twice. So we'll copy that out again. Then we'll paste that into the JavaScript console. Remove those parentheses. Then put two string in, <laughs> and then we end up with minified, but un but deobfuscated code. And uh, I just throw that into Clojure Compiler, put it on white space only in pretty pint, and then we have some code that we can actually read. Um, I mean, if you can read code, I guess. Not everybody can read 
Anyway, it, I can read it. That's the important thing really here. So here's the interesting function that I fundamentally found the XSS in. And I'm very good at, at least I have a lot of experience in reading garbage code. So I'll, I'll sort of interpret this because it isn't written like code should be. Um, probably mainly because of the minify, but I don't know. I'm not going to make any assertions as to how well it was written. So um, the first bit says, um, this was running on this hidden page I found, by the way, just to, in case you've lost the context here, because I have. Um, it checks to see whether there's a hash component, and then checks to see whether the hash component begins with an exclamation mark. And then it checks to see whether that hash component past the exclamation mark includes HTTP. If it does, then it, move, it sends the browser to uh, whatever RT is, and forwarding the URL for, uh, that, that is stored in that hash component. So the game plan here is there's a common XSS that's known, probably called DOM XSS. I really don't follow these very well. Um, where if you send a JavaScript protocol with window.location.replace, you can execute any JavaScript code you want. So that's what we're going to fundamentally be trying to do. But you can see that RT is at the beginning of the URL, I think. Yeah, RT is at the beginning of the URL. So we'll take a look at the definition of RT. Uh, here we are. Here's the, here's the code from before. So RT is just you take the search component, which is past the question mark. Oh, nice. I've designed these slides pretty well. So here's the, the search component is everything past the question mark, and then the hash component is everything past the hash. I'm sure a lot of you know that, but I'm just here to be patronizing. Um, it's actually search.slice4, which means it's the fourth character on. So we just we pad our XSS with uh, A's, or whatever character you want. Um, and then when somebody loads this, um, it should try and redirect the browser to JavaScript alert one, which uh, should bring up a pop-up box, which as we know is the most important form of hacking. Um, <laughs> here's an aside. Uh, this is what the if redirect then redirect looks like currently. And um, I just wanted to put down some opinions on this fix here because you might notice that it's this huge wall of purple text. And what that is is a regular expression that passes URLs. Now, it's a sanity check, right? But to me, what a sanity check means is that you put down a control, and that control makes sure that the input that goes into the program is the same as what the pro as what the, the input that goes into the program is the same as what the programmer expects the input should be. So the regular expression should reflect the programmer's understanding of the structure of the input. Now, I don't understand that. I don't think anybody should understand that. And if you do understand that, please report yourself to the nearest robot detention center. I've actually got the rail diagram that shows like how this thing works. And like, I know the font's too small, but even if the font was big enough, you still wouldn't be able to understand that. Okay, uh, I might talk about this slide, I'm not sure. Okay, we'll talk about this slide. Wait, uh, I had this phrase that I was gonna say, and I'm not really sure, like, there's, there's a passive hilarity to leaving this slide on here with no explanation, but what I was gonna say was like, there's a, you know, there's a phrase in programming a lot, which is like, if it quacks like a duck, and it looks like a duck, I almost forgot the second part there, oh my god. Um, then it is a duck, but this thing doesn't check to see whether it quacks like a duck, it just checks to see whether it looks like a duck. And the whole metaphor that I was trying to work with is that like you might mistake this for a duck. Okay, anyway, don't worry about it. Um, I haven't really worked, this This is the first time I've done this presentation, so I haven't worked through it very well. Okay, so uh, this part of the presentation is called actually reading someone's taxes. Um, I put in my XSS thing and it gets blocked by what's called a web application firewall. Um, well, application firewalls are not very smart. They sort of have a list of all the things that they expect you to send them that are dangerous. So if you if you channel your inner creativity, your childlike creativity, and do something that it hasn't seen before, then you can go past the web. And in this case, I simply replaced these parentheses with back ticks. That's all I did. That's just replacing two characters. And there we go. We, we bypassed the WAF, and we have XSS on the tax service. But we're going to go further than that, because I mean, this is called how to hack the tax system. But I guess that doesn't actually illustrate what I'm trying to say. It's, what I want to do is I want to actually steal information out of my own tax account. And I guess steal isn't really a good word, but like the idea is you could steal it from anybody's tax account. I'm going to find out how much money I earn, because I, I don't remember this kind of thing. Um, so luckily this information is stored on this web page here on the internet through your web browser, internet.com. Uh, as I said, I've only started using computers recently. We have the uh, X-Frame option same origin, and that means that any page can load it as long as it's on the same origin. Our XSS is on tax.service.gov.uk, so as far as the browser is concerned, the code that I'm sending is sent by uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs Online Tax Service, although it really is sent by me. That's the trick here. Um, 
So we can just, uh, I don't remember what's on the next slide. Oops, sorry guys, we're going to the future now. Oh yeah, so like we can open up that page in an iframe, and since we have same origin policy on it and we can embed it, embed it we can iterate on our payload, this payload says create an iframe, and then find the element which is called employee name zero that contains the payment, my, the amount I earned last tax year, then make a pop-up window showing that information. So that's our, that's, our, um, that's our payload, but we need to combine that with the actual vector we're using to inject XSF. I think those are the words people normally use. Anyway, so we combine this with the thing that I did before, with the AAA JavaScript, stuff like that. Let's try that out. Uh, we get blocked by another WAF, but as I mentioned before, WAFs aren't very smart, so we just need to do something it hasn't seen before. So I threw a bunch of numbers at it, and I have this function called string dot from char code. It actually didn't like string dot from char code, so I split it up. And just splitting it up with one space meant that it n had no idea what it was doing. So I added a num uh, these numbers translate to the code that I put that I wrote before with this function string dot from char code. This is the full exploit uh, URL thing that you send somebody to. Uh, is there anything else I want to say about that? Anyway, so TLDR, the WAF thinks this is completely unsuspicious and just a normal thing that people would browse to. Did I go to the next slide or did it not go to the next slide? Okay. Um, oh, yeah, then another problem comes up. And that problem is that you are logged out after a certain amount of time. Luckily, the first part of this presentation is like a foreshadowing thing. We found a vulnerability that it logs you in, and then once you're logged in, redirects you to another place. So if we combine our vulnerability that has the XSS with the one that logs you in, then you have this link that you can follow that logs you into the HMRC, then once you're logged into HMRC, it forwards you to the page that has the XSS payload, which then shows you the amount of money you'll pay, which shouldn't be a surprise to you, as I've said before. Um, but taxes are complicated anyway. Um, yeah, so we combine it with this other thing and we end up with this even longer string. Um, if you're wondering whether you should understand what this says, and I don't understand what it says. Uh, like, here's the forwarding URL thing with the continue parameter, and the continue parameter just has our numbers that we, we came up with before. Oh, success! We've, we've succeeded. Here we are. Like, I've just run a vulnerability on myself, and I've successfully hacked myself. I'm in full control of my own capabilities, as I was before, hopefully. But there we go. You can see that I earn blank block amount of money per year, or tax year. OK, so this is the boring bit. Um, I wrote this slide because like, the thing that I've written so far only covers the first three days, pretty much, of this whole thing. And it's the thing I find most interesting. But I think it's really important to talk about like the process of actually getting something fixed because not talking about that thing is kind of the same as pretending that thing didn't happen. Um, so I, at, the, at this point, the hero of our story, that's me by the way, um, I found the, uh, found the vulnerability, I've got telephone number, I physically telephoned somebody, which is something I've never done in my life. Um, I talk to this human being, they give me this email, I send an email with the previous vulnerability in it, and then I stay up late at night eating pizza, I was actually eating pizza, um, finding the second vulnerability, and I sent this to them. Well, that, doesn't ha that didn't happen, but this happens now. I'm sending it to them now. They stop responding to me, and uh, they, they only start responding to me when I uh, send notice to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs tax service press office that I'm writing this article I intend to publish it at some point in the future. So I get called up in the middle of my dinner. I know that's not a big point, but it was a very important dinner to me. I was having Japanese. Um, <laughs> and uh, I get told that I'm going to be promoting crime, that loads of crimes are going to happen. I was just really taken aback by that completely. I had no real response to that. I don't know if I said any words because I don't remember. It's just blotted out of my memory. But the thing I should have said is like, it's the tax system. Uh, if you think I'm going to be encouraging people to hack the UK tax system, then uh, I just wonder what criminals have been thinking where, where we keep all our financial data and money. I don't know how criminals work, as I said, I'm a good person. Anyway, uh, so the, they give, I uh, convince this person who's, who thinks I'm going to uh, create loads of crime and stuff like that, that what they should do is get in contact with the NCSC, the National Cyber Security Center, who I don't know at this point in time, but they are fantastic people. And um, they dig out this email, and the email I get, uh, the email I get never gets any kind of reply. It has one hit on the internet somewhere, and uh, 
it's for like, I don't know, green grocers or something, but I actually, sorry, it does get a reply, but that reply is a receipt email that tells me that I'll get a reply at some point in the future. But I, I still haven't got a reply, and I don't know, it's probably years later, I don't understand how time works. So I give up, kind of. I talk to a friend who works with intelligence services, who puts me directly in touch with the NCSC, because the NCSC is actually, used to be, and still is to a certain extent, a wing of the UK uh, intelligence services, GCHQ. Then the, N the NCSC act quickly and have both issues fixed, and they're wonderful people, and I'd like to say thanks to them for, for helping me solve problems of the UK tech system. Do I have some time? Is, yes. is this time correct here? Because I don't think it is. Have I spoken for that long? Okay, this is a really long piece of uh, writing that I wrote for my... Um, how long have I been speaking for? Can you tell me, or is that a secret? No, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, nobody knows. <laughs> All right, it's it's seven twenty. Uh, the introduction was maybe fifteen minutes, so take that. So you've been talking for about half an hour. Oh, good. I still have time. Okay, so I wrote this really nice epilogue to the really big article that I mentioned before, and I just want to read it out. I'm going to stand behind the podium and stop moving around. Um, we live in an age where the great engines of our time are spun simply out of ideas, tethered to the universe only by the flickering of charges in a silicon dye. Sadly, I don't think I'm ever going to fly through the sprawling dark cities and networks pictured in film. It hurts especially that I'll never be able to pull off sick grinds with my friends in cyberspace on the internet superhighway or probably learn how to rollerblade. I do think ha that, however, the things that we put into our computers live in their own little universe, so drastically different from our own. There's no concept of space here, but there are universal laws, rules upon rules, upon which a software application, an app, a program, a video game will live and die. We came up with these, of course. We call them protocols or APIs sometimes. As someone who finds vulnerabilities in software, many parts of this foreign universe are more intricately familiar to me than the places I've lived. Someone with the right knowledge can send a little idea of their own into the computer, one that interacts, competes with, and manipulates others' ideas to the author's own ends. All of us with these abilities have a moral compass they must construct for themselves. I don't think anything has given me more respect for an individual's right to their own boundaries and privacy than living and working every day with the knowledge of how to strip those boundaries away. Not all I end up seeing the same way. I try, to do, I try my best to do the right thing, but sometimes you can't help trying to avoid putting yourself in that place where you should be doing the right thing. You ask yourself, if I invest a little time trying to do the right thing, am I going to be sucked into a 57-day trek trying to see it through? There comes a point in which doing the right thing seems to have been the wrong choice. If you choose to walk down the moral high road with security issues, sometimes you'll find people who care as much as you do. Other times you'll find people whose job you're just making more difficult. People who think you're trying to harm them or their company and people who just don't understand. These are fights you have to fight yourself. I'm happy to be working in security in a time when we have bug bounties where sometimes if the planets all align, I can feel like I didn't do the right thing just because I had to. But the places where security help is needed most are the places that don't have these security investments. The places that don't know, can't afford, or don't understand the value of security. The places with no security email addresses or responsible disclosure procedure. The security issues I found were complex. The issues that made fixing them take 57 days are simple and common. Good security is an invisible luxury most places can't afford. Security teams are expensive and hard to measure successful. Security is young. I hope if I have children, they get to live in a world that better understands the risks and rewards of putting their data in that little silicon universe. Uh, I have a little note that I copied from my article here that says, take care of yourself, stay healthy, stay cozy, get regular exercise, take breaks, go outside, look at a plant, be as real with people as your feelings are to you. And I think that's a note for me, but I've read it out anyway. Um, thanks and salutations. I'd like to give a special thanks to my secret friend who put me in touch with the NCSC, National Cyber Security Center, that they do not wish to be named. Thanks to the NCSC for being so courteous and accommodating. I'd like to thank Thomas Fox Brewster for listening to some of my frustrations over Twitter DM. Thanks to, thanks to Sam for inviting me to talk here. I'd like to say an additional special thanks to Pluffy, who is and has always been encouraging, helpful, and perhaps most importantly, ready to help edit the mess that I call prose. Um, additional thanks to my friend Pipe, who is a wonderful human being and got the demo of this talk before I made it here and greatly improved the quality of my talking ability. Um, okay. Music recommendations. So I have this running joke on Bug Crowd where I sent all of the vulnerabilities I sent, sent in come with music recommendations. Um, so I'm gonna I recommend three albums. So the first one is called Romaplasm. It's Bath's album, it just came out recently. It has this really chill yet upbeat vibe and takes you on this fantastical journey through sky and space with all your friends and perhaps one more than friend. There's Emancipator's Soon It Will Be Cold Enough, which has this ch awesome chill dream like wintry vibe to it. It's quite upbeat. I actually deleted this album from my music library because I'd listened to it so much. I was sick of it, but I just rediscovered it and I haven't become sick of it again. So that, that gets a thumbs up from me. 
Last Max Richter's Memory House. This one I feel is a little more divisive. Um, it's a beautiful album that seems to embrace melancholy and profound beauty. I'm not sure it's for everyone, but as somebody who gets anxiety issues, lying in bed awake at, awake at night, awake at night, being able to listen to this has probably increased my lifespan by a tangible number of years. Um, that's the end of all the words I have to say. I think I have some more words to say here. Um, oh, thanks for listening. I really appreciate having a chance to be listened to. It's a profound wish of mine to become someone who's capable of talking to groups and effectively express my ideas. I'm glad to have the opportunity to be able to grow in that respect. Uh, the background art, which you might have seen, is really beautiful. It's by Atkinson Grimshaw, who was a Victorian painter who lived in the 1880s. And a lot of his, he's famous for beautifully lit scenes in the middle of the night. And I really enjoy that. And I empathize with being alone in a beautiful place in the middle of the night. Uh, maybe questions? I actually have a questions thing that I've, I've, I've got here. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. So was a fantastic talk. OK. <laughs> Uh, right, so uh, questions online, please uh, ask there. I think a few questions are coming coming up. Yeah. yeah. Jose, I'd just like to say a couple of words. So, Jose, here is a fantastic example of a young millennial security researcher uh, who had to struggle with a uh, old fashioned device called the telephone. Because yeah. in our modern world of digital technologies and all the government being digital and on Twitter with verified Twitter accounts and email addresses and contact us forms uh, and ver various uh, government websites where say uh, or we are very serious about cyber security is it 57 days it took 57 you? days 57 yeah. days it took to actually to get to that end of the physical telephone line talk to someone who actually was well it took three days to get to the telephone line and 57 days, days to get anything fixed exactly um so i, I think yeah. i think this is a very uh, very interesting point in the story. So um, I would like to ask first question, okay. I may, as an yeah. organizer. I just um, want to say that first, like the whole telephone thing, yeah. I actually had to ask my parents to help me because I've never seen one of these things before. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Right, so uh, my question is obviously, uh, we all learned about this, or at least I learned about this story from uh -huh. BBC. Yeah. All right, can you tell us how did you get into BBC? How did I get into BBC? Oh, well, I broke in, uh, and I wrote the article myself on one of their computers, and then I published it myself. Um, uh, this is uh, Thomas Fox Brewster, I mentioned before. He's a journalist at Forbes, who I, uh, he, he wrote an article when I hacked uh, Mr. Robot, the Mr. Robot website. I haven't talked about all of the stuff that I've done. I, I've broken some interesting things, and one of them was, uh, I got remote code execution on Mr. The, the website for the Mr. Robot TV show, which is a TV show about hacking and security, and I find that really ironic. Um, I went through the whole disclosure thing, I didn't do any damage, I helped some people, and um, I asked if he wanted to run an article on this tech stuff I was doing, which sounded pretty, pretty interesting and impressive, at least to me, um, and uh, he passed me on to the BBC. Excellent. Okay, um, right, questions from the audience? Anyone? <laughs> right, like is that a good sign or a bad we sign? Have, yeah, we actually have questions online on uh, Facebook. Yeah, I have, I have questions on here as well. Yeah. Let's do a Facebook ad all the way first. What is a full stack engineer? Oh, I got this question on here as well. And somebody actually has answered it. But a full yeah. stack engineer is someone who does back end and front end development and often infrastructure development. This is in contrast to just focusing on one of those areas. I actually just copied that from the person who wrote the second comment. I didn't actually come up with that, but it's true. Uh, I, I, my history as a developer was I did a lot of stuff on my own. I learned how to code on my own, and as a result, I only really knew how to build things on my own without working with anybody. So when I went into the technology industry, I was just sort of self-directed uh, consulting for various startups to build MVPs and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun, uh, pretty lonely. I ate a lot of pizza and watched a lot of TV. Question. Any, any more questions, guys? Anyone? Okay. Ah. Ah. Oh, yeah, there's one. <laughs> hey, so I work with um, Responsible Disclosure Programs. Yeah. Uh, we had a, um, a customer recently, and they rejected uh, reflected cross-site scripting, saying it's a non-issue. Really? And it's really interesting, because your exploit relies on that as its like yeah. first step, but it's like a composite attack. 
Yes. So I was just thinking, if you'd have reported that at that stage, mm. the potential is in, in certain circumstances, you could have just been rejected and said, this is a non-issue. Yeah. Like, uh, well, I completely sort of disagree with the, like, I, I discussed this more in an article, but I completely disagree with the idea that XSS is a non-issue. And one of the reasons I have this humorous dog slide is because, like, I think that people have this idea, they, they think like cross-site scripting or they think reflected cross-site scripting and they're like, oh, that's not a big issue, someone has to click that in an email. But the thing that really is the impact, the impact statement that is the thing that you make the decision on whether it's a real terrible security issue or not. And the fact that somebody can like pretend to be the tax system and steal your information is the real, like I know we report everything in terms of vulnerabilities, but that's the real statement on which the vulnerability is dangerous, right? Um, that's why I talk about that a lot. Because I think that if I said to if I said to some people, oh, I found a cross-site scripting vulnerability in the tax system, they might say like, oh, it's just a cross-site scripting vulnerability. But if I say like, I was able to send a link which manipulated, read and read all your financial data, that sounds much more important. I feel like some people in the industry like run this shortcut in their brains when they hear certain kinds of vulnerability. Everybody wants remote code execution of various things. But there are things other than remote code execution, and especially things other than remote code execution, which can be really dangerous. Um, I, uh, one, of the, one of the things I find a lot of joy in is a lot of bug bounty programs uh, explicitly disallow logout CSR. And uh, I spent a lot of time trolling on the internet. And I used to run this thing on forums uh, owned by my friends, which I had permission to do, uh, where if you, you know, if you link an image that has a logout CSR in, Every time somebody loads that page, they're logged out immediately. So I, I've been doing a bunch of attacks on various websites where, like, you say, for example, you have a, a website that does customer service. If you send the customer service person a link to an image and that image is logout, out, they are unable to do their job. I'm just saying that, like, the actual <laughs> type of vulnerability is completely irrelevant. The most important thing is what you can do with that vulnerability. And I, I sort of wish that the information security community would catch up with that knowledge. Yeah, it's interesting because we have um, our own policy. Is, yeah. um, it basically says if you can do anything bad, yeah. then we'll pay 10K. Yeah. And, and if you can do anything medium bad, then we'll do like $500. So rather than doing it based on severity or CVSS or whatever, you know, um, yeah. kind of it's more about impact. So it's just making me, making me think about like what is the perfect policy yeah. for this kind of thing. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah no worries. Cool. Any more questions? Are there okay. any questions on Facebook.com? <laughs> no. Yeah. Right. Well, we're looking for questions. So can I just uh, add a comment, obviously, about cross-site request forgery vulnerability uh, that Thomas just mentioned. And of course, about open redirects. This is how the whole thing started. Yeah. These both vulnerabilities now <laughs> dropped off all our top 10, unfortunately. <laughs> but the reason is because uh, we've done a survey, right? The survey collected the vulnerability data uh, from uh, big names, big vendors who basically scan for vulnerabilities, thousands of applications, and they give us a, a statistics page. And say, okay, if we look at these statistics, actually, um, issues like cross-site request forgery is no longer that big of an issue because there are a lot of frameworks who take care of it, right? And open redirect, there's still a bit of a question about uh, well, it's not, what was the exploitability of this? And right? I say, you can't hack us, right? Well, you just do some phishing or redirect people to some evil website, but our money is safe, right? Well, not quite, your customer's money is not So uh, what we're doing with Sharif uh, is we're adding um, another page, which is called the developer guidelines. And these developer guidelines, all these vulnerabilities, they will be there because developers need to know about these vulnerabilities, how they work and what they need to do in their code in order to avoid them and to mitigate them. Okay, uh, Sharif, any more questions? So well, someone uh, asking uh, what do you think about malware detection problems? Yes. Yeah. So it's a malware detection problems question? It's not really my area. I'm an yeah. application security engineer. I mean, I think they're probably bad. They sound bad. Well, um, web no, malware. <laughs> Sorry? Web-based web malware. Web-based malware? Like detecting web-based malware on other people's computers? Or what? I, sorry, obviously you don't ask the question. I don't know why, you're, why yeah, I'm no, asking no, because you. Because it was just a one-line question, but I think... What do I think about it? Uh, yeah. I think online malware is bad. I mean, it's malware. That's what the word means, I guess. Uh, sorry? It's French, isn't it? Malware. Oh, it's French? Okay. Sure well, I'm learning today as well. Yeah. I think it's bad. I think... Uh, I'll put, like, I don't know whether I mentioned it in the talk, but I have it in my notes. Like, A lot of online malware uses obfuscation, but almost all the obfuscation is trivial. Uh, it's pretty easy just to write a script that, like, hooks eval, it hooks the function constructor, and then if the program tries to eval any statements or 
construct any functions using the function constructor. It just prints them out as a string, and you can just do that recursively in a sandbox, and that will, like, I've never seen a piece of an obfuscated code that didn't get passed. Okay. Uh, there's one more question in the back. So I really like that text that you had, and I think you should really push it out. So have you published somewhere? Sorry, which piece the of text? text? You read? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the words? Yes. Yeah, I put them on the, on the internet. Uh, <laughs> you can find it, like, if you... Do I have my Twitter account? Yeah, if you yeah. go to my Twitter account, I tweeted and then it. you can find, there's no link to my Medium account, so that's actually not a good one. Uh, you can probably just Google how to hack the UK tax system, and it'll be at the top somewhere, I hope. I, my SEO is not very good, but I've Googled it myself a lot of times, I will admit. And um, there are some really good words there, better than these words that I've just produced. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, one more. So open the redirect is bad. So how do you fix this, and what kind of uh, other things can you do rather than open data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, one of the, so I, we, I brought up the slide that shows like the fix that was deployed to the service that I exploited, right? And it's got this huge regular expression. I think the most important thing is like defense and debt, sanity checks and stuff like that. Um, and sanity checks have to be written properly. And okay, this is just opinion. Properly is is, a, is subjective. But I think if you write a sanity check, it should reflect exactly what you believe the, the input URL should be. And in the sense that, like, um, if you think that all the URLs you're expecting to your system should start with a single forward slash, I'm going to unplug my computer in case it shows anything. I'm quite scared of computers. I've already mentioned that. Um, so if you think all the URLs should start with a single forward slash, have your regular expression say, expect single forward slash. And then if you think everything past that is going to be A to Z, Expect A to Z. You have a blacklist. I mean, that's probably on OWASP somewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, do that. And then maybe pass the URL. But yeah, I think the most important thing is just check that the, your, check that the inputs reflect your understanding of what the inputs should be. They won't, won't protect you against everything. Um, if you can, and this isn't always applicable, um, whitelist every single possible redirect. There is nothing better than that, and there's nothing uh, I already said that. I already said nothing better than that. I don't know what I was going to say after that. Um, but yeah, that's the best thing you can do. I hope that answers your question. Cool. OK, I think this is all we have. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for a fantastic talk. <laughs> um, uh, well, if you have more questions, you can ask Thomas during the break. So now it's break time. So we can have uh, whatever is left over of pizza and a few more drinks. <laughs> <laughs>